a privilege this morning to introduce Joel James, who will be preaching in a few moments. And Joel James has been a faithful pastor in Pretoria, South Africa for 28 years at Grace Fellowship. He is a friend of Scott Maxwell's all the way back to university days. He has been a friend of this ministry for years. You have benefited from Joel James's preaching here in person. Uh, maybe you've stalked him online and listened to some Joel James sermons. Whether you recognize it or not, you have been impacted by his writings, whether you've read what he's written or benefited in this church from those who have. If you've worked through any hermeneutics material here in this church, you've suffered uh, in some sense and benefited under his handiwork. And then, of course, Joel James gave to us, or lent to us for a time, Ryan and Elna Mitchell and Sebastian and Callista. It is a church that knows the sacrifice that missions requires. In a very real sense, cutting off a right arm and, and sending it out into the world where it is needed at great personal cost, not only to Joel and the friendship and the ministry there, but to the church, Grace Fellowship. And so really setting an example of what it means to see the gospel go forward, to see the church in expansion, or as Joel has said often, the, the church with a passport. That's what missions is. And, and of course then, Grace Fellowship sent Ryan and Elna Mitchell to Papua New Guinea, and there they have been a vital part of the work to unreached peoples there. And they have held the rope well in an exemplary fashion for missionaries a long way away doing hard, arduous work. And I would commend to you this morning Joel James's labor on our behalf in Equipping Hour. If you were not in Equipping Hour, I want to commend to you the message that Joel just preached there. You need to add this to your podcast reservoir. Uh, you need to put it on repeat and put it in your calendar every month or so or 12 months or 12 minutes, whatever you need uh, to benefit from what Joel did there, and, and I will just leave it as a surprise to you, the content of it, but say it is a, a must listen. It was said of the Puritan writers that they were doctors of the soul, and apparently the Puritans are not dead, they are not all yet in heaven, uh, because Joel James must be one of them. With surgical precision, he diagnosed for us a prevalent and often undiagnosed condition of the human heart, and then with tender care gave us remedies. And I know I'm rambling about the sermon some of you just heard. You, you need to listen again, and all of us need to hear what he gave. It reminded me of a bone I have to pick with you, Joel, the pain and tenderness, something about head wounds and rubbing alcohol. And the pain that you dealt me personally in South Africa, the, the physical scars have gone away. The emotional scars still remain. And the pain and the healing you brought this morning in equipping hour was much preferable to that. So come again and bless us with God's word, Joel. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Smedley. It is a great pleasure to be here and to have our hearts knit together in this ministry and to this ministry. As Smedley said, Scott and I go clear back to, to college, and Smed's been over to preach for us in South Africa, and we have so many mutual friends, and Ryan and Elna, and so we just certainly feel from my church a, a unity with your church here in Phoenix, and it's a privilege to be here and just cement that today and open the Word of God with you. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Psalm 131 this morning. Having given the stick this morning in the Sunday school class, um, a painful lesson today, uh, or now, this hour, I want to give the carrot uh, some words of encouragement from a wonderful and powerful little psalm, Psalm 131. It's a song of the sense of David's, he writes, O Yahweh, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. Nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. 
My soul is like a weaned child within me. O Israel, hope in Yahweh from this time forth and forever. Let me begin this way this morning. In my younger years, I raced bicycles, triathlons, that sort of thing. And so, so I still enjoy keeping up with things like the Tour de France and that sort of racing. Now, as you might know, if you've ever watched the Tour de France, the organizers of a race like that, they categorize, they assign the major climbs in that race to different categories. The easiest hills, relatively speaking, are given a category four rating, and then the pain works up the scale through category three to category two until it reaches the really leg-breaking climbs in a sense, and those are given a category one label. However, a handful of the Alpine and Pyrenean passes are so steep and so long that the race organizers give them a final dramatic tag, and that is the beyond category category. Now, a number of factors are considered before a climb is assigned that melodramatic beyond category label. Where the ascent comes in the race, early on or later in the race, well, that's important because any climb feels hard after 200 kilometers, even just climbing off your bike. The average gradient of the climb is also factored in. Normally, a climb's average incline is going to have to be 8 to 10 percent at least to be given a beyond category label. And at select moments, the, that, that pitch might go up to 20 percent, something you might hesitate to drive up in your car. The duration of the climb also is vital. Two kilometers at 10 percent, well, that's nothing to scoff at, but that's not even going to begin to sniff a beyond category label. On the other hand, 15 kilometers at 10%, that's a hill that'll make Superman contemplate turning in his cape. And not to be overlooked, something you might not think about if you're not a cyclist, not to be overlooked is the quality of the road surface. That's very important as well. Riding on rough tarmac is much more exhausting than cruising along on smooth pavement. All the little bumps of a secondary tar road become a million mini mountains sapping a rider's strength. Now, I've taken the time to explain that because what David does in Psalm 131 is he teaches us <clears throat> excuse me, how to ride the beyond category climbs of life. He's not going to deal with the cat four, cat three, two, not even one. He wants to direct our attention today to show us how to ride up the beyond category climbs of life. He wants to show us how to handle situations in which the road feels so steep and so long and so rough that all you want to do is collapse in a gasping heap of hypoxic defeat. Now, David's secret for riding up those worrisome beyond category climbs in life is really pretty simple. It's hang on to God's car and let him tow you up the mountain, right? Hang on to the car and let him tow you up the mountain. Now, studying a psalm, any psalm, and this one as well, studying a psalm is a process, a process of discovery. It's a, a process that sometimes involves both steps and missteps. What I'm going to do this morning is take you back to Tuesday or Wednesday in my study when some time ago I studied to preach this sermon. I want to take you back and I want to walk you through the very process that I went through, the steps and missteps that I took as I was studying this passage. I want to show you the process of discovery and hopefully create in you the fascination for the scripture and help you understand how we go at this thing called interpreting the Bible. So the theme of the psalm is not hard to discern. I think you saw it as we read through it. There's no secrets there. David is contrasting an uptight, worry-producing pride with a humble, serene trust. Uh, that's not hard to pick out. So far, so good. However, early on as I was studying this passage, I, I, I made a mistake. I, I came to a conclusion that led me in a wrong direction, and it quickly forced me to retrace my steps. David identified the solution to worry in verse 1. He says, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Aha, I thought. That means that the key to godly serenity... The key to godly serenity is avoiding entangling myself in the complicated affairs of this world. 
Keep everything low key. Move to a cabin in the woods in Alaska. Avoid all the neck tensing, stomach devouring, headache inducing responsibilities of life. Instead, take up some kind of monastic, hermit-like existence. That must be the key. That's the biblical solution to dealing with worry. And, you know, verse 2 seemed to confirm that. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. David pictures himself as a, a child sleeping contentedly in his mother's arms. There's no fretting, there's no kicking here, there, there's no howling for supper, there, there's not the picture of the red face, you know, the little infant fist clinch screaming for milk. None of that's going on here. A childlike withdrawal from all complicated relationships and stressful situations, that must be the key to overcoming worry. And having arrived at that little nugget of wisdom... I sat back in my chair and thought, you are nuts, Joel. That is the stupidest thing that I have ever heard. That sounds like something Scott Maxwell would have preached. (laughs) What am I thinking? (laughs) We've been friends a long time. How in the world am I supposed to shun all the worrisome responsibilities of life and still be a pastor, for example? I mean, leading a church and doing marriage counseling, for example, both frequently require that I entangle myself in troublesome situations. In fact, if all the mature people in the church withdrew from leadership and pursued reclusive, sort of self-serving serenity, who would shepherd the flock of God? And with that in mind, I obviously had to retrace my steps. I'd obviously jumped to a wrong conclusion. And in fact, about two seconds of thinking brought me to the conclusion that avoiding worrisome responsibilities in life was even less realistic for David than it was for me. From the moment that David killed Goliath, his life had been one long entanglement in great affairs and difficult matters. First, David had been Israel's king in waiting for more than a decade. And that certainly had not been an easy, stress-free season of life. Serving under King Saul, a fickle, jealous, angry boss, if there ever was one, serving under King Saul had been, well, something of a nightmare, to be honest. After a decade of court intrigues, close escapes, foreign exile, David eventually became the king of Judah, remember, his own tribe, But as you recall, he had to endure a a seven-and-a-half-year civil war before he actually ascended to the throne of all of Israel. I'm sure that there were many times in those years that David longed to withdraw, to withdraw to a cave in the wilderness, take up a solitary existence of prayer and contemplation. Oh, for the days of his youth, the innocence and the bliss of t- chasing sheep and fighting bears barehanded on the hills around Bethlehem. He would love to have gone back to that. But in spite of the stresses and pressures that he faced, David didn't pursue the life of a hermit. And of course, you know, life didn't settle down much once David started to rule over the entire nation. By necessity, the life of any conscientious king is an unending parade of great matters and difficult decisions. As king, it was David's responsibility to preside over court cases that were too difficult for the local judges to decide. He led the nation into battle. He supervised an expanding empire overseeing international relations with countries like Ammon and Edom and and Aram. He managed the royal court subduing, or in the case of Absalom, merely surviving the plots, the schemes, and the intrigues that are endemic to any royal court. David also had to respond to national crises, such as drought and famine and plagues. In short, David was the prime minister, 
of his country. He was the Supreme Court, the Commander-in-Chief, the head of the Diplomatic Corps, and the Minister of Internal Affairs all rolled into one. And did I mention he had about a dozen wife and a busload of wives and a busload of kids, right? Whatever the key to David's victory over stress and the sin of worry, moving to a cabin in the woods wasn't it. Now, we do need to pause for a moment, pull up the handbrake for a moment and say there is wisdom to making decisions that simplify life. Uh, I'm all for that. That's one of the most important things I do in counseling. I don't get scissors out. I get garden shears out and start cutting things out of their schedule. Right? Let's not downplay the importance of that kind of wisdom. An overdeveloped sense of our own indispensability frequently motivates us to shoulder too many duties. I've never done this, of course, but others like you maybe have. Right? Inevitably, it leads to some kind of collapse spiritually, emotionally, physically, and so on. And so, without ignoring the wisdom of keeping life simple, it is clear that David did not achieve the godly, childlike tranquility of Psalm 131 by abdicating the throne and retreating to the cave of Adullam to raise sheep and write poetry. You know, what if all the great men in biblical history had done that? I mean, just think about the disaster. What if they had chosen that solution to worry? If they had, Moses would not have led God's people out of Egypt, and Joshua would never have captained the conquest of Canaan. Samuel would never have, jun un have never judged the unruly tribes of Israel, and Elijah would certainly never have confronted Ahab, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal. Isaiah and Jeremiah would have remained silent rather than face the rigors of prophetic ministry. Daniel would have re refused to serve as the chief administrator for two world empires, and Nehemiah would never have built a wall. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul would have chosen to live in quiet retreat in the Arabian desert rather than giving himself body and soul to the evangelizing of the Roman world. And most importantly, our Lord Jesus Christ would have stayed in heaven shunning the painful and complicated responsibilities of the incarnation, including his death for sinners. All in all, it seems unlikely. It seems unlikely that Psalm 131, that there David is promoting dodging responsibility as the key to spiritual serenity. So, missteps, retracing of steps. In fact, as I studied this psalm in detail... I found that there was one word, really, in this psalm that pulled me back from that unlikely interpretation and, frankly, absurd application. There was really one word that pulled me back from that, and the key that unlocks the interpretable block of this passage is a word found at the end of verse 1. O Yahweh, my heart is not proud, my eyes are not haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Depending what version you're reading, they translate that last line, the last set of words there, a little bit differently. It might be too marvelous or too high, too wonderful, too profound, or too different like the New American Standard does. The Hebrew word is the word palah. You, you find this word a lot, the word palah a lot, in the Psalms speaking of God's wonderful acts. It's often translated that way. God's wonderful acts. Palah referred to things that God does that are extraordinary. Things that God does that are beyond human capability, beyond human capacity to even understand, let alone do. As you would guess, the word palah is often used in the Psalms of God's miracles. A very common one would be the dividing of the Red Sea, for example. The ten plagues, the providing of manna in the desert, and so on. Those are palah acts, wonderful, incomprehensible acts of God. Now, palah was used also in a context of men, sometimes in the functioning of men as well. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 17. I want to show you three examples. Uh, one's found in Deuteronomy 17. I'll show you three examples of this word palah. And as I said, it will be the key that unlocks the door of this passage for us. When used in the context of men and their functioning, palah referred to something wonderful in the sense of unsolvable unsolvable. 
something inaccessible to human understanding, impenetrable by human logic. Let me show you three examples of that. The first one is here in Deuteronomy 17, verses 8 and 9. Moses is talking to the future judges of Israel in the law court system, and he says, if any case, verse 8, Deuteronomy 17, 8, if any case, any claw case is too difficult for you, the local judge, to decide between one kind of homicide and another, was it murder or manslaughter, I can't figure it out, between one kind of lawsuit or another, between one kind of an assault and another, being cases of dispute in your courts, then you shall arise and go to the place which Yahweh your God chooses. So you shall come to the Levitical priest or the judge who is in office in those days and you shall inquire of them and they will declare to you the verdict in that case. This law case was pala for this local judge. It, it was too difficult. He just couldn't discern the situation and the solution. Well, that's an enlightening use of this word. It was beyond his abilities. Now, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 and you see another, a second use of this word. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. Here Moses has given peop the people the law and he's urging them that by the help of God, you can do what God has said. You, you don't have to go across the sea, you don't have to go to heaven, right? You, you can do what God has said with God's gracious intervening help. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you. Now, obviously, that involves divine intervention and help, doesn't it? But it's not too difficult for you. It is not out of reach. You don't have to go up to heaven or across the sea. Right? Here God says that his commands in the Mosaic Law are not inaccessible. They are not some kind of unsolvable, ununderstandable mystery. Now, Proverbs gives us a third very helpful illustration of this word, pala. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Two from Deuteronomy and now one from Proverbs chapter 30. In verses 18 and 19 of Proverbs 30, we get a third illustration of this wonderful, too difficult concept. Proverbs 30, verse 18. There are three things that are too pala, too wonderful for me. For which I do not understand, the way of the eagle in the sky, how in the world can a bird fly, the way of a serpent on the rock, can you track a snake when it's crawled across a piece of granite? No. The way of a ship in the middle of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid, with a woman. There are some things about life, says Proverbs, in this world that are just impenetrable to human analysis. Now, today we might understand a little bit more about flight and snakes and navigation of ships and that sort of thing than, than Solomon did, but, but I would suggest to you that last one is still befuddling. Explain love and the craziness of that. I don't explain it, I just enjoy it, right? So, you're starting to get an idea of this word pala now. It refers to court cases or situations in life that are simply unsolvable, irresolvable. It refers to things that are beyond human solution, beyond human contribution even, to something that be, is beyond my ability to comprehend, beyond my ability to change. With that understanding, the pieces of Psalm 131 now easily fall into place. Back to our psalm. Psalm 131, verse one. O Yahweh, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things that are pala, that are, are just too difficult for me, that are simply beyond me. Now, what kind of great matters did David have in mind? Well, it can't be the general complexities of life and relationships. It, it just simply cannot be that. It would, it would have been neither desirable nor noble for David to try to escape from them. However, there were situations in life, as king or otherwise, that were simply beyond even David's prodigious management skills. There were problems that were simply irresolvable from a human perspective. There were things that were completely and utterly beyond David's control, things he could not change, not even with a royal decree. 
In fact, there were situations in which God did not expect David to cooperate in the solving of the problem so much as he expected David to surrender or to submit to him God as he, God, solved the problem. That's the wisdom of Psalm 131, not the cabin in the woods in Alaska. Peaceful, worry-free humility is expressed when you stop worrying about things that are in God's category, things that are those beyond category climbs of life, not cat four, three, two, not even one, but those climbs that are so long and so hard and so steep that the only thing you can do is hook on to God's bumper and let him pull you up. You see, the word Pilat just didn't refer to fourth, third, second, or even first category climbs. This is David's counsel for how to respond to life situations that are beyond human capability to resolve. And so, guided now into the right track by the word Pala, let's work our way through this little life-changing psalm. Simple outline, we're going to see the solution in verse 1. Assumes a problem, doesn't it? But the solution in verse 1, the illustration in verse 2, and the application in verse 3. Let's start with the solution. Verse 1. O oh, Yahweh, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or things that are too difficult, too wonderful, that are simply out of reach of my short little alligator arms. I just don't involve myself in those things. Now, this is the solution, obviously, then there must be a problem, right? In this case, as I've said, the problems are not the difficulties, the normal difficulties and complexities of life. As king, David's life was full of complex, unavoidable problems. His schedule is crammed full of great matters. That's not what he's meditating on here. He is meditating on the kinds of problems that are too big even for a king to fix. In such cases, says David, godly humility lays back on God like a child resting on his mother's shoulder. I'm not going to kill myself worrying or fretting or tying my stomach into knots. I will ask for and implement the humility of God's spirit by acknowledging that this matter is just too big for me. I can't solve it, can't control it, I can only give it totally over to God. Now, perhaps an example or two would help, right? An example or two of the kind of problem that I think David has in mind here would help. Let's start with an easy one. Start with an easy one, the weather. The weather. By the way, I, 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 I've always been to Phoenix in August in my previous trips, you know, and it was 120 at 5 in the morning, you know. And so I came this time expecting it to be cool and spring-like, and it's going to be 105 today or whatever. <laughs> so I need to come in December, I guess. The weather, let's start with that one. Let's say that you were planning an outdoor wedding. This is not a fake scenario. This happened to Ruthie and me in our wedding. Okay? So this, this, this is real. Right? Let's say you're planning an outdoor wedding. Everything is going smoothly, but then two days before the, weather, the wedding, the weather forecasters begin to predict thunderstorms for the appointed glorious afternoon. In the face of that potential crisis, there's not a lot you can do. You can't move the wedding indoors. All the indoor vet venues have already been booked. Purchasing every umbrella in the city seems untenable, and the one thing you definitely can't do is change the weather. Weather is a problem that resides in God's category, doesn't it? You can fret and you can fume. You can tear your soul to shreds and devour your stomach lining with anxiety as you frantically pore over meteorological charts on the internet portraying jet streams and cold fronts and all that. But in the end, it's just not going to make a whit of difference. Because as the book of Job so powerfully reminds us, only God controls the weather. Alternatively, you could imitate David in Psalm 131 and humbly admit that supervising the weather, that's a beyond category climb. That, that one's in God's category alone. And as a result, embrace the calm, God-trusting 
biblical view of the matter. Now, that one's relatively easy unless you're two days out from your wedding, right? Well, that one's relatively easy. Let me give you a second example. It gets a little more painful here. How about the future of our children? Ouch. The futures of our children. Well, you know what? God does expect you to cooperate in that. This is not absolutely something that is in God's category. There's a lot that you can do, even right now, to contribute to your children's future adult lives. You, you feed them nutritious meals, you teach them the word of God, you live godly in your home, Christ-like examples that will hopefully set the course for them and their life. You teach them to read, you help them with their algebra homework, right? you teach them the skills and the proverbial wisdom necessary to navigate your way through the, the rocks and the reefs of life. You speak the gospel of Jesus Christ to them, you pray for them relentlessly, but can you in the end live your child's life for him? No, you can't. At some point, your children's lives obviously move outside the sphere of your direct control and into the God-only category. Now, the truth was, it was always in the God-only category, you know that. It was always really in God's category all along. But there's a point where it obviously moves outside. The, the cooperation part from your side just doesn't disappear, but you realize that it's really God's deal now. The parents who early on, who early on humbly acknowledge that their children's future is a beyond category climb, those are the parents who enjoy the tranquility and the humble childlike trust ascribed to David in verse two when they think about their children's future. You're supposed to contribute, there's no doubt of that, but there comes a point where you have to let go of the steering wheel, and you close your eyes and say, okay God, they're yours. Please keep them between the lines, right? O oh, Yahweh, my heart is not proud, and my, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. You see, there are just some problems that are obviously and undeniably in God's category. Having talked to the women, let me talk to the men for a minute. How much can we do, men, to deal with things and to change things like the world economy and the political situation in our countries? You think yours is bad? Come visit me, right? How much can you do to manage and control and determine what is going to happen in the, in the world economy, as an example? Oh, you can respond in some wise ways. There's some things you can do. You can get rid of debt and do things like that. But in the end, can, is there anybody in this room who, who can determine by sheer brute effort and influence and by irresistible competence can change whether there's going to be a recession or inflation or not? Anybody that important in this room? Probably not. In the same way, you can build a fence around your house where I live in South Africa, but you know what? We can't stop crime. Can you, by unremitting worry, solve the myriad of politi political crises in our day? You see, while there are some things that we can and should do, perhaps in each one of those categories, we eventually come face to face with the reality that some issues are beyond category climbs. They're just too steep, they're just too long. I, I can't make it up, even if, I, even if I get off my bicycle and push, I can't get up this. Stop worrying about the things that are in God's category, says David. Now as king, David could fix a lot of problems. You know, there's some bad sides to being king. One of the good sides is you get to fix problems, right? David could fix a lot of problems as king, but there were some problems he just could not make go away. There were some problems he could not solve. David couldn't make the Egyptians, the superpower to the south, go away. David could build cisterns and irrigation systems, but he couldn't stop a drought. He can't make it rain. He can't make bone-dry fields produce crops. 
there are some things that are just flat out in God's category. And godly humility acknowledges that and turns them over to the Lord. Now, having seen in verse 1 the kind of beyond category problems David is talking about and the solution, let's go ahead and look at his illustration. His illustration in verse 2. It's a marvelous one, of course. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. Rather than work himself into a frenzy about things that were obviously in God's category, David composed and quieted his inner man. One commentator translate this, translates this, I have kept my soul level and tranquil. Well, that's kind of good, isn't it? I have kept my soul level and and tranquil. And the illustration of David's stable, tranquil heart, of course, is a child in his mother's arm. Now, David says specifically this child, his soul, is like a weaned child. And that's in contrast to an infant. Now, in contrast to weaned children or a weaned child, you know what an infant is like. They, they will suck your, 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 your chin, your elbow, you know, anything that comes within range, hand, their feet. I don't know how they get them up there, but they, they will suck anything in a frantic effort to get milk. David says, no, not that child. I'm not referring to that kind of child. In fact, a weaned child in their culture probably would have been at least three years old. They, they breastfed a long, lot longer than we typically do. And therefore, David envisions himself as a three- or four-year-old child. A three- or four-year-old boy, energetic, active, adventurous. However, on one of those rare occasions when he feels a little bit out of sorts, he touches his mother on the arm and says quietly, Mommy, can I sit in your lap? What mother can resist that, Right? Uh, my wife was almost glad when our son got sick because it was the only time that he could slow him down enough to sit on her lap, right? Invited up, he crawls up, crawls contentedly into the safety and security of mom's arms and dozes off to sleep. He's not crying, he's not squirming. Here, he is safe from disturbance and danger. That's David's illustration. My soul is as calm and content and trusting as a sleeping child. You say, how did David get to that tranquil state? Not chemically, by means of medication. Not immaturely, by avoiding all thorny decisions and vexing responsibilities. In fact, in the midst of what could only be an immensely complicated job as the king of Israel and an arduous daily schedule, David achieves spiritual tranquility by humbly relinquishing all beyond category issues to God. Calmness comes when we trust God with childlike faith, with a childlike humility, maybe even with childlike sleep. You know, I sometimes say to myself, I wish I was better at this. You know, it's easier to preach on this than it is to do it, right? I sometimes say, okay, God, you're, you're going to be up all night anyway, right? I know you're going to be up all night anyway working on this problem, so if it's all right with you, if it's all the same to you, I'm going to go to bed, and I'm going to go to sleep. See you in the morning, right? I wish it were so easy. It's the spirit of Psalm 46.10, cease striving and know that I am God. Cease striving. The context in that passage is of war. And again, let me ask the question, how many people in this room can personally and significantly cont contribute to, for example, bring to a cessation the war in Ukraine? I don't know, maybe there's somebody here that can, right? But probably most of us can't do much there. How do you handle that kind of beyond category problem? Cease striving and know that I am God. I am the one who makes wars to cease. God can drive up the mountain pass and not even have to shift down. Grab onto his bumper and let him haul you over the climb. 
Now, it's got to be an active kind of trust. There are times when we are to cooperate, right? Um, one of my favorite verses on this whole subject is Nehemiah 4, verse 9, where they're threatening to come and attack the building work on the wall, and Nehemiah says, we prayed to our guard, to our God, rather, we prayed to our God, and we set a guard. I say, they prayed, and they strapped on a sword. Well, that's active trust. We're going to pray, and then we're going to act like God might actually answer the prayer, and he might use us to answer the prayer. We're going to trust God, and we're going to strap on a sword. If you need a job, you pray, and then you open the, um, the want ads. That dates me, doesn't it? <laughs> so, Psalm 131, we see the problem, the solution, obviously, in verse 1. The solution, especially the illustration, and now in verse 3, the application. O Israel, he says, hope in Yahweh. Hope in I am. Hope in the eternal I am, the self-existent one. Hope in Yahweh from this time forth and forever. When you move from verse 2 to verse 3 in Psalm 131, you step across a line from the personal to the national. That's pretty common in David's Psalms, isn't it? With David, that line between personal and national is always a little bit blurry because, well, he's the king, right? And therefore, he always tends to consider spiritual truths from a national perspective and not merely a personal one. Furthermore, I would suggest to you that the beyond category problems that David faced most commonly would have been national in nature. Drought, famine, plagues, international incidents... In fact, for the kings of Israel, Israel, historically speaking, beyond category climbs were as abundant as blades of grass on a football field. You know some of the examples. King Hezekiah faced an invasion by an angry Assyrian army of 185,000 men. There is no human solution to that. Unless somebody's come up with a nuclear weapon, you know, there's just no solution to that for the nation of Judah. Verse 3, O Israel, hope in Yahweh from this time forth and forever. Hezekiah, you remember, spread out Sennacherib's letter before the Lord and God delivered the nation. God towed him up the beyond category climb. Similar situation in 2 Chronicles 14, 11, King Asa faced a migration of Ethiopians similar in scope to the Exodus itself. We're told there a million people were invading Israel in an inexorable mass of human bodies. Asa prayed, Lord, there is no one besides you to help between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Yahweh our God, for we trust in you. It was another case where national hope and personal peace intersected. Another place where that happened in is Exodus chapter 14. Turn there for a moment if you're quick enough. Exodus chapter 14. It's another place where Israel faces a beyond category problem, the Red Sea. Moses here is the de facto king of Israel, not by name, but certainly in function. Pinned between the Egyptian army and the depths of the Red Sea, Israel was in a situation totally beyond their ability to manage. Exodus 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near and the sons of Israel looked, behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they became very frightened, so the sons of Israel called out to Yahweh, and they said to Moses, is it because there is no graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Doesn't really sound like a prayer, does it? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. I love this. 
Yahweh will fight for you while you keep silence. Call, crawl into God's lap and just fall asleep on his shoulder. Right? And you remember what happened in the chapter. The Lord, verse 30, saved Israel. Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw Egypt dead on the seashore. And that's the idea of Psalm 131. This problem is in God's category. You have to lean back on God's chest and trust his sovereignty, wisdom, power, and goodness. That's not a bad place to be. So, I think it's obvious that Psalm 131 is not promoting some kind of monastic, hermit-like abdication of responsibilities in the pursuit of peace and tranquility. There is, let me say it again, there is great wisdom in simplifying life. Nonetheless, the key to peace is not withdrawing from all onerous duties. Instead, David promotes a kind of humility that presses believers to acknowledge the beyond category problems of daily life. There, there are things that I am to contribute to and trust God as I do that. There are some things I can make no contribution to. They are pala. They are too wonderful. They are simply beyond the reach of my short little arms. I can't get to them. Proud hearts worry and fret about such things. They beat their hands black and blue. They break the bones in their hands, battering on the doors of heaven, battering God with demands and plans and schemes and accusations and assertions, how God should manage or change their situation. In contrast, the level and tranquil, the humble heart, acknowledges that when the gradient becomes so steep that you just can't crank the pedals around even one more turn, what you do is you grab onto God's side mirror and let him pull you up the mountain. And if I can give you one last example of that, that's exactly how our Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity Face the steepest and most shattering climb that a human being could ever face, the cross, the cross. Peter says of Jesus in 1 Peter 2, verse 23, while being reviled, he did not revile or verbally attack in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but you know the verse, he kept entrusting himself to God the Father, to the one who judges righteous. Enduring everything related to the cross to the crucifixion was harder than riding a bicycle up Everest. How in the world did in his humanity Jesus of Nazareth, God the Son incarnate, how did he face that by entrusting himself to God? Same counsel, same counsel. And that's exactly David's word of wisdom to us in Psalm 131. Sleep like a child, in face of problems that are simply beyond your ability to resolve. And you do it by entrusting yourself to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to the good God, to God for whom no problem, no problem is a beyond category climb. You can trust that God. And let's pray. Lord, we have different problems represented by here, by the hundreds of people here. We have problems that are undoubtedly for some in the health category, for others, relationships. For some, it's children, things I mentioned. For some, they might be facing the failure of a business or great challenges in ministry, whatever it is. Lord, we're thankful that we can come to you and like David, we can climb into your arms and rest and find comfort. Our soul can be level and tranquil. Um, Lord, we thank you that you are the God who for whom no climb is a beyond category climb. I pray for each individual. I don't know the names. I don't know the people. You do. But I pray for them, each one. I pray that you would give a package of your grace this morning from your word, from through your spirit, to each one who simply needs to hold on to some comfort and package of grace from you, that you would give, in fact, yourself, Lord that we would trust you as those who believe and love you, that we would trust you and calm our hearts down and just acknowledge, hand over, really everything, but especially those beyond category climbs, that we would hand that over to you and 
rest like a baby in your arms. We pray in Jesus' gracious name, amen.